Hi and welcome to the second part of my lecture on reproductive anatomy, this time on internal generative organs. To download my lecture deck, please go to my WordPress site, Docina Obigaine. This is the reference for my lecture. And this is the outline for this lecture. So first we talk about the cervix. So this is the lower narrow portion of the uterus. And the word cervix originates from the Latin word for neck. The Greek word for neck is trachelos. So when the cervix is removed surgically, the surgical procedure is termed trachelectomy. This is mostly composed of um, fibrous tissue, which is in contrast to the mostly muscular corpus of the uterus. The vagina is attached uh, obliquely around the middle of the cervix. And this divides the cervix into an upper supravaginal portion and a lower segment in the vagina called the portio vaginalis. The supravaginal segment is covered by peritoneum posteriorly and is surrounded by a loose fatty connective tissue, which is the parametrium, anteriorly and laterally. The canal of the cervix is fusiform, as you can see here, with the widest diameter in the middle. The width of the canal varies with the parity of the woman and changing hormonal levels. The cervical length increases in pregnancy with maximal length in the second trimester. The cervical canal opens into the vagina at the external os of the cervix. This is the external os of the cervix. In the majority of women, the external os is in contact with the posterior vaginal wall. The external os is small and round in nulliparous women, such as this one. So this is the external os of a nulliparous woman. And the external os of a multiparous woman, on the other hand, is wider and gaping. And this is because of vaginal delivery. The mucosa lining of the endocervical canal of a nulliparous woman is arranged in longitudinal folds called the plicae palmitae with secondary branching folds called the arbor vitae. These folds, which form a herringbone pattern, disappear following vaginal delivery. A single layer of columnar epithelium lines the endocervical canal and the underlying glandular structures. This specialized epithelium secretes mucus, and this mucus facilitates sperm transport. An abrupt transformation usually is seen at the junction of the columnar epithelium of the endocervix and the non-carotinized stratified squamous epithelium of the portia vaginalis. The dense fibromuscular cervical stroma is composed primarily of collagenous connective tissue and mucopolysaccharide ground substance. The collagen framework and ground substance are sensitive to hormonal effects. The connective tissue contains approximately 15% smooth muscle cells and a small amount of elastic tissue. The cervical and uterine vascular supplies are interrelated. So the arterial supply of the cervix arises from the descending branch of the uterine artery. The cervical arteries run on the lateral side of the cervix and form the coronary artery which encircles the cervix. The azygous arteries run longitudinally in the middle of the anterior and posterior aspects of the cervix and the vagina and there are numerous anastomoses between these vessels in the vaginal and middle hemorrhoidal arteries. The venous drainage accompanies these arteries. The lymphatic drainage of the cervix is complex involving multiple chain of nodes. The principal regional lymph nodes are the obturator, common iliac, internal iliac, external iliac, and visceral nodes of the parametria. Other possible lymphatic drainage includes the following chains of nodes, the superior inferior gluteal, sacral, rectal, lumbar, aortic, and visceral nodes over the posterior surface of the urinary bladder. The stroma of the endocervix is rich in free nerve endings, and pain fibers accompany the parasympathetic fibers to the second, third, and fourth sacral segments. Next, we have the uterus. The uterus is a thick-walled, hollow muscular organ located centrally in the female pelvis. Now, adjacent to the uterus is the urinary bladder anteriorly, and the rectum posteriorly, and the broad ligaments laterally. It has the general configuration of an inverted pear. The short area of constriction in the lower uterine segment is called the isthmus. 
And the dome-shaped um, top of the uterus is what we call the fundus, this one. The oviducts enter the uterine cavity at the cornua. This will be the cornua. And these are the oviducts on each side of the uterus. So the uterus basically has three layers. First is the thin serosa layer, this one. This is the serosa layer, the outer layer. Makes up the visceral peritoneum. Next is the myometrium, this one, which is the muscular layer and is composed of three indistinct layers of smooth muscle. The outer longitudinal layer is contiguous with the muscle layers of the oviduct and vagina, while the middle layer has interlacing oblique spiral bundles of smooth muscle and large venous plexuses. The inner muscular layer is also longitudinal. The third layer is the endometrium. And this is a reddish mucous membrane that varies in thickness depending on hormonal stimulation. The endometrium is divided into an inner stratum basale and an outer stratum functionale. The stratum functionale is subdivided into an inner compact stratum and a more superficial spongy stratum. Only the stratum functionale responds to fluctuating hormonal levels. The uterine and ovarian arteries provide the arterial blood supply of the uterus. The uterine arteries are large branches of the hypogastric arteries, while the ovarian arteries originate directly from the aorta. Veins of the pelvic organs accompany the arteries, and therefore, the venous drainage from the fundus goes to the ovarian veins, and blood from the corpus exits via the uterine veins into the iliac veins. The lymphatics from the fundus and the body of the uterus go to the aortic, lumbar, or pelvic nodes, surrounding the iliac vessels, especially the internal iliac nodes. The lymphatic drainage of the uterus is not that different from the lymphatic drainage of the cervix. Now, in contrast to the other pelvic organs, the afferent sensory nerve fibers from the uterus are in close proximity to the sympathetic nerves. Afferent nerve fibers from the uterus enter the spinal cord at the 11th and 12th thoracic segments. The sympathetic nerve supply to the uterus comes from the hypogastric and ovarian plexus. The parasympathetic fibers are largely derived from the pelvic nerve and from the second, third, and fourth sacral segments. So in some women, the uterus is antiflexed or antiverted, whereas in other women, the uterus is retroflexed or retroverted. So as you can see in this picture, an antiflexed and an antiverted uterus is a uterus that is tilted uh, towards the urinary bladder or tilted forward in the abdominal cavity, whereas a retroflex and a retroverted uterus is a uterus that's tilted away from the urinary bladder or tilted backward in the abdominal cavity. Now, what's the difference between an antiflex and an antiverted uterus? So, as you can see here, no, notice the blue line. So, in an antiverted uterus, you see that the cervix is tilted towards the urinary bladder or towards the or forward into the abdomen. Whereas an antiflex uterus, not only is the cervix tilted forward, but also the body. So it's both the cervix and the body of the uterus that's tilted uh, towards the urinary bladder. So the same goes with a retroflexed or a retroverted uterus. So for a retroverted uterus, you see that the cervix is uh, tilted backwards or tilted away from the urinary bladder. Whereas a retroflexed um, uh, uterus has a cervix and the body uh, both tilted backwards. Now the third is the oviducts or what we call the fallopian tubes. And this is a paired uterine tubes as you can see here. It's paired because it um, originates from both uh, the cornua of the uterus and it extends outward from the superior lateral portion of the uterus and ends by curling around the ovary as you can see here. So the oviducts are also called or are also referred to using the prefix salpingo, which is coming from the Greek word salpinx, meaning a tube. So the tubes are contained in the free edge of the superior portion of the broad ligament, and the mesentery of the tubes, the mesosalpinx, contains the blood supply and the nerves. The uterine tubes connect the cornua of the uterine cavity and the peritoneal cavity. The ostia into the endometrial cavity are 1.5 millimeters in diameter, meaning it's this part here. Whereas the ostia into the abdominal cavity, this one, are much wider. It's about 3 millimeters in diameter. 
Each tube is divided into four anatomic sections. So first, we have the interstitium or the interstitial segment or what we call the uterine intramural segment. And this is about 1 to 2 centimeters in length. This one, this part here, and is surrounded by the myometrium. The next segment is the ismic segment or the ismus. And this begins as the tube exits the uterus and is approximately around 4 centimeters in length. The segment is narrow, 1 to 2 millimeters inside. As you can see here, it's so much narrower than the interstitium or the interstitial segment. And uh, it is uh, straight. And it is the most highly developed musculature. The ampullary segment or the ampulla, this one, this part here, is about 4 to 6 centimeters in length and approximately 6 millimeters in inside diameter. It is wider. Uh, than the ismic area and more tortuous in its course than other segments and usually fertilization normally occurs in the ampullary segment of the tube now lastly we have the infundibulum this part here and this is the distal trumpet shaped portion of the oviduct and uh, from 20 to 25 irregular finger like projections termed uh, this one the fimbriae surround the abdominal ostia of the tube now, one of the largest fimbria is attached to the ovary. Uh, well, unfortunately, it is not shown in this picture. So, one of these fimbria will be attached to the ovary, and that is what we call the fimbria ovarica. Now, the tube contains numerous longitudinal folds, which are called plicae of the mucosa and underlying stroma. The plicae are most prominent in the ampullary segment. The mucosa of the oviduct has three different cell types. So we have the columnar ciliated epithelial cells, which are the most prominent near the ovarian end of the tube, and overall compose 25% of the mucosal cells. Next, we have the secretory cells, which are also columnar in shape and compose 60% of the epithelial lining and are more prominent in the ismic segment. Next, we have the narrow peg cells, which are found between secretory and ciliated cells and are believed to be morphologic variant of secretory cells. The smooth muscle of the tube is arranged into an inner circular and outer longitudinal layers. Now, between the peritoneal surface of the tube and the muscular layer is an adventitial layer that contains blood vessels and nerves. The arterial blood supply to the oviducts are derived from terminal branches of the uterine and ovarian arteries. The arteries anastomose in the mesosalpinx. Blood from the uterine artery supplies the medial two-thirds of each tube. The venous drainage runs parallel to these arterial supplies. Now, the lymphatic system is separate and distinct from the lymphatic drainage of the uterus, and the lymphatic drainage includes the internal iliac nodes and the aortic nodes surrounding the aorta and the inferior vena cava at the level of the renal vessels. The tubes are innervated by both sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves from the uterine and ovarian plexuses. Sensory nerves are related to spinal cord segments T11, T12, and L1. The majority of ectopic pregnancies occur in the oviduct. The acute abdominal and pelvic pain that women with an ectopic pregnancy experience is believed to be caused by hemorrhage. The most catastrophic bleeding associated with ectopic pregnancy occurs when the implantation site is in the intramural segment of the tube. The ismic segment of the oviduct, this one, this part here, is the preferred site to apply an occlusive device such as a clip for female sterilization. The right oviduct and appendix are often adjacent, and clinically, it may be difficult to differentiate inflammation of the tube from acute appendicitis. The fourth is the ovary. Now, the paired ovaries are light gray, as you can see in this uh, laparoscopic shot. So, and each one is approximately the size and configuration of a large almond. The surface of the ovary, as you can see here, is pitted and indented from previous ovulations. The ovaries contain approximately 1 to 2 million oocytes at birth. Now, during a woman's reproductive lifetime, about 8,000 follicles begin development. However, approximately only 300 ova uh, eventually are released. As the woman ages, the ovaries become smaller or atrophic and firmer in consistency. 
The long axis of the ovary is vertical in a nulliparous woman who is standing, and the ovary rests in a depression of peritoneum, which is named an ovarian fossa. This will be the ovarian fossa. Okay, so immediately adjacent, adjacent to the ovarian fossa are the external iliac vessels, the ureter, and the obturator vessels and nerves. There are three prominent ligaments that determine the anatomic mobility of the ovary. So first, we have the mesovarium, this part here, which attaches to the anterior border of the ovary. The mesovarium um, contains the arterial anastomotic branches of the ovarian and uterine arteries, a plexus of veins, and the lateral end of the ovarian ligament. Next, we have the ovarian ligament. This is a narrow, short, fibrous band that extends from the lower pole of the ovary to the uterus. And the third is the infundibular pelvic ligament or the, what we call the suspensory ligament of the ovary, which forms the superior and lateral aspect of the broad ligament. This ligament contains the ovarian artery, ovarian veins, and accompanying nerves. It attaches the upper pole of the ovary to the lateral pelvic wall. The ovary is subdivided histologically into an outer cortex, this is the cortex part, and an inner medulla. The ovarian surface is covered by a single layer of cuboidal epithelium, which we also call the germinal epithelium. If the ovary is transected, such as a cross-section, which we see in this picture, we will see numerous transparent fluid-filled cysts, noted in the cortex area. Okay, so microscopically, these are graphene follicles in various stages of development. So we also see um, an, an active corpus luteum here and a regressing corpus luteum and some atretic follicles. Now the stroma of the cortex is composed primarily of closely packed cells around the follicles. So you can see here, so these are closely packed cells around the follicles. And this specialized connective tissue form the theca. The medulla, on the other hand, contains the ovarian vascular supply and a loose stroma. The specialized polyhedral hilar cells are similar to the interstitial cells of the testes. Now, each of the ovarian arteries arises directly from the aorta, as you can see in this picture. So, the right ovarian artery arises uh, directly from the aorta just below the renal arteries. They descend in the retroperitoneal space. They cross anteriorly to the psoas muscles and the internal iliac vessels, and they enter into the infundibular pelvic ligaments, reaching the mesovarium in the broad ligament. The ovarian blood supply enters through the hilum of the ovary. The venous drainage of the ovary collects in a pampiniform plexus and consolidates into several large veins as it leaves the hilum of the ovary. The ovarian veins accompany the ovarian arteries and with the left ovarian vein draining into the left renal vein, as you can see here, this is the left renal vein which the left ovarian, art, uh, left ovarian vein drains into, whereas the right ovarian vein here drains directly to the inferior vena cava. The lymphatic drainage of the ovaries is primarily into the aortic nodes um, adjacent to the great vessels at the level of the renal veins. Metastatic disease from the ovary occasionally takes a shorter course to the iliac nodes. This one. The autonomic and sensory nerve fibers accompany the ovarian vasculature in the infundibular pelvic ligament and they connect with the ovarian hypogastric, and aortic plexuses. So the last part of this lecture, we talk about the vascular system of the pelvis. So first we have the ovarian artery, which we already mentioned in the previous slide. So the ovarian arteries originate from the aorta, as previously mentioned, just below the renal vessels. And each one courses into the retroperitoneal space, crosses anterior to the ureter, and enters the infundibular pelvic ligament. The ovarian artery unites with the ascending branch of the uterine artery in the mesovarium under the suspensory ligament of the ovary. We also have the common iliac artery and uh, the bifurcation of the aorta occurs at the level of the fourth lumbar vertebra, this one, 
and it forms the two common iliac arteries. Each common iliac artery is approximately 5 cm in length before the vessel divides into an external iliac artery and an internal iliac artery. The internal iliac artery is also what we call the hypogastric artery. So we have the hypogastric artery or the internal iliac artery and these are short vessels approximately 3 to 4 cm in length and throughout their course, they are in very close proximity to the ureters. Each hypogastric artery branches in a, into an anterior and a posterior division or trunk. So the posterior division gives off three parietal branches, the ilulumbar, lateral sacral, and superior gluteal arteries. Whereas the anterior trunk has nine branches. The three parietal branches are the obturator, internal pudendal, and the inferior gluteal arteries. And the six visceral branches include the umbilical, middle vesicle, inferior vesicle, middle hemorrhoidal, uterine, and vaginal arteries. The superior vesicle artery usually arises from the umbilical artery. Now, the uterine artery are, arises from the anterior division of the hypogastric artery and courses medially towards the isthmus of the uterus. Approximately 2 cm lateral to the endocervix, around this area here, it crosses over the ureter and reaches the lateral side of the uterus, this one. So the ascending branch of the uterine artery courses in the broad ligament, running a tortuous route to finally anastomos with the ovarian artery in this area, in the mesovarium. Throughout its circuitous route in the parametrium, the uterine artery gives off numerous branches with, uh, that unite with the arcuate arteries from the other side. This series of arcuate arteries, as you can see here in this area, develops radial branches that supply the myometrium and the basalis layer of the endometrium. The arcuate arteries also form the spiral arteries of the functional layer of the endometrium. The descending branch of the uterine artery produces branches that supply both the cervix and the vagina. And here's a summary of the collateral arterial circulation of the pelvis. You see her branches from the aorta, which include ovarian artery, inferior mesenteric artery, the lumbar and vertebral arteries, the middle sacral artery. We also have the branches from the external iliac artery, which we uh, call the deep iliac circumflex artery and the inferior epigastric artery. And finally, we have the branches from the femoral artery, which are the medial femoral circumflex artery, and the lateral femoral circumflex artery. So next we have the veins. The venous drainage of the pelvis begins in small sinusoids that drain to the numerous venous plexuses contained within or immediately adjacent to the pelvic organs. In general, the veins of the female pelvis and the perineum are thin-walled and have few valves. The veins that drain in the, the pelvic plexuses follow the course of the arterial supply. Now, their names are similar to those of the accompanying arteries. Now, as I've said earlier, the left ovarian vein empties into the left renal vein, whereas the right ovarian vein connects directly with the inferior vena cava. Now, that's it for my lecture. So, we have discussed the anatomy of the cervix, the uterus, the oviducts, and the ovaries, and also discussed uh, some of the vascular supply and the venous drainage of the internal reproductive organs. Thank you for watching this video and please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel and my WordPress site.